I'm interested in the T part of WETA. I'm going to talk about training, training of translators. And I'm going to argue that we've been too much focused on translators. Everybody's been talking about literary translation. Uh, I, most of my graduates don't become literary translators. Our field is dominated by models like this, the competencies of the translator, or this, more competencies, or this, a model to produce professional interpreters in this case, but it could also be translators. Our field is also full of studies that try to bridge the gap between... Is a problem there? Somebody's got the microphone on. Okay. Uh, bridge the gap between training and employment or training and industry. Many, many studies. Now, what happened here in Melbourne, I'm in Melbourne in Australia at the moment, uh, my doctoral student, you there, you how, uh, did a survey of our graduates, of our master program, our master of translation. And she was shocked to find that in their jobs, their employment after going out, you can see there in red, those are the translators and those are the interpreters. So about a third of our graduates become translators or interpreters. Help, what's going on? We're here to train translators and interpreters. Only a third become translators and interpreters. What does this mean and what does it mean for interdisciplinarity? Now, I was not surprised to find that. Many years ago, I was teaching in Barcelona and I did see some studies that indicated something very similar. And you can see it here if you look closely at the numbers. Who goes into translation? Well, 25%, 34%, and the interpreters are in or out of the calculation. And then, look, I'm just going to show you that statistics mm, can do weird things, right? 86.6%, .6%, something's wrong here. But you go down and look at it, those 86.6% .6 of the respondents had worked as a translator, okay? And if you go into the numbers, you see that everybody there said all the jobs that they could do. And if you count up the number of jobs and then do the percentage of translation jobs, 29.25, about a third. So my claim is that on the few studies that have been published, only about a third of our graduates become translators and interpreters. That's what I want to claim, and I'm going to show some numbers. I like literary translation, but I like numbers too. I like to talk about things that I can have some data for, with apologies. So this is another study, 2016. It's the European Master of Translation, Masters of Translation. One. 1,722 in 22 countries, it's a sizable thing. And look here, we find that language services up around 56 or 54%, which is pretty good. And translators, look, 35%, and then the other things, right? So this looks a bit better, because we've got 53% of our graduates going into language services, okay? And bear with me, though, only 35% of them are translators. So the numbers of translators here are just, in fact, 22% of the entire sample. So it's actually below a third. Uh, if we want to add in translators plus revisers, reviewers, and localizers, and this is where I'm getting to, we get to 36%. So about a third again. My argument uh, holds, I think, only about a third become translators or interpreters. And this study didn't look at interpreters because it's the European masters in translation, as in written translation. Another study by CLT schools, 2,800, so it's a bigger study, 19 countries, uh, published um, written by a team uh, led by Peter Schmidt in, in Leipzig. Uh, here it looks good. 
Would you describe your main occupation as language related? Oh, yeah, 85% or something, very, 86%, very, very healthy uh, number. And then would you describe your current main occupation as translation or interpreting related? And what do we find? 1,287, which means 45% of the entire sample. Okay, so 45%, uh, less than half. So even in this CLT study, which supposedly looks at the most prestigious translator training institutions, we're under half. But then, but then they go on and ask, what is your main current occupation? And you can see there you've got some interpreters and translators. Count up the numbers, 616, 244, and in fact, the people who are working mainly as translators or mainly as interpreters, 30.57%. I rest my case, one third. I have one more study to look at. This is from the Zurich uh, University of Applied Sciences, uh, where there is a, a BA and an MA program. And uh, this is interesting because they really do follow their students very closely uh, after they leave. And this is uh, from the bachelor's program, one year after graduating. And you can see perhaps at the top there, I've got to remove my little image there, uh, translation and interpreting 18.8%, which is very low, and teaching down here 9.4%. Uh, so there's not much at all. Uh, as you can see. But if we go into, uh, but look at all these other occupations that they go into. And that's what interests me. And then I, I move to the Zurich study uh, where they look at the MA graduates. This is 74 respondents, so it's a very small sample. And they are of a specialization in translation and conference interpreting. And here we find something rather more interesting. Uh, the, I, I cite this Zurich study because they've got the people's main jobs, then their second jobs, and then the jobs that they do freelance or, or ad hoc or in the, the gig economy, you know, the, the things where they're self-employed as. And this is very interesting, I think. Uh, of the 49 main jobs, 16, so 32%, one third, okay? The hypothesis holds. But in the second jobs, 43%. And if you look at the third level there, the, 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 the self-employed, we get up to 95%. What does this tell us? It says that people get jobs as translators and interpreters, but only a third. But even then, people are doing translation and interpreting as a second job, or they're using the skills in some other capacity as they become multiple job holders. And I think this is the reality of employment, at least in Europe uh, and Australia, I would add. I'm not going to give lessons to China. You can work it out for China yourselves. What I'm finding from these studies is that translation skills are being used by many graduates, even though their main job is not as a translator or interpreter. And you found this in our study of our graduates because we then did interviews to see what they're doing. And we asked them, if you're not working as a translator and interpreter, why? What's the reason? And you find down here only about, only eight, so 6%, here was saying, because I couldn't find a job, although no suitable job was available, is because they regard it largely as um, not as being contemporary or casual. It's something they could do, but they could do in combination with something else. And when we went into it, we found that the vast majority were in fact combining jobs. So even when they one graduate is employed as an air traffic controller, okay, but she translated a manual into Chinese for air traffic control. Others are teachers, but they are translating as well as teaching. Most literary translators are teachers or university professors, 
at least in Europe. I don't know about China. And, um, uh, and a lot are able to use translation activities in their language teaching as well. So what's interesting here is that the skills we're training people in don't just go into one profession or two, translation or interpreting. They're going into many, many, many kinds of professions and people are combining those occupations uh, as they deploy their translation skills. Now, I followed up the interpretation of the previous studies. This is from Gary Massey, who is the director of the program in Zurich, and we discussed the results. And he said, yes, you're, you're right, your analysis is correct, but, and here you've got it, we also include intralingual, okay? So that would be uh, German to German, yeah? Subtitling, audio descriptions, other forms of accessible communication as a form of translation. So when they do the analysis of the statistics, they have a wider view of translation than the one that I applied when I was interpreting the statistics. And then I got in touch with Daniel Tudik, who did the uh, EMT study, and we got much the same thing. He says, yes, it's correct, but we add proofreaders and revisers, and then translation project managers and terminologists and localizers, then you get a very, very big um, percentage of people being employed as translators. And uh, Daniel Tudik then goes on that these are not jobs that he would describe as a diffuse penumbra. This was the term I've used in the report on this study of, of the things that are around translation, as he says, they are an increasingly important part of the project, of the process. That is, translators do far more than translate, as somebody said once. So to make sense of the results, my second um, proposal is this, that translation skills are used by many graduates, even though their job title is different. Uh, and what we're finding as a tendency in the global translation market is the, the names for things that translators do are becoming wonderfully diverse. This is a study by Esther Bond in Slater. She just went through LinkedIn. She found as many as 600 names for jobs that translators do. 600. Uh, to give you a sample of them, I just took solution and looked at the jobs that have solution in them. Uh, so translators are working for their clients, for example, as a solutions architect, director of client solutions, What's a solution to a communication or language problem, okay? Uh, you can read them there. Cloud solutions architect. I love these creative names for, for translation. Translated solutions manager for machine machine intelligence. Okay, so that's the second message. If a third of our graduates are going into translation and interpreting, the others are still using their translation skills, but under new names and perhaps in new fields. This is very clear. I'm going to give a very quick talk. You'll be very happy about this. Uh, the most important thing that's happened this week in the world of translation in Europe, not with China, perhaps not in the rest of the world, is a merger between this company, RWS, and SDL. Uh, SDL, you might know, is the company that owns uh, and develops Trados. Okay, now RDS, I'm just looking at the, uh, it's not a merger, RDS took over SDL, or is taking them over. Look at what they do, right? There's translation and localization, but their money really comes from intellectual property services, okay? Translation asset management, e-learning, training and e-learning, localization testing, language quality assurance, consulting. These are the kinds of jobs that translators go into, even though translation and interpreting are only listed twice there. And if we look then at SDL, this is from their splash page as well. Yes, they do translation and localization. They also do creative and media production. That is 
we can go beyond the strict definition of translation and use our language and communication skills there as well. And if you're on the technical side of things, product testing and data training. So I think that when we th talk about interdisciplinarity with respect to training translators and interpreters, we really have to talk about that kind of interdisciplinarity, training people for that range of fields. Now, I'm closing with a personal reflection. Uh, thinking back on my graduates, and I've had a lot over the years, uh, I find that they work as, let me see, real estate agents, okay? That's where you make money in Melbourne, okay? Fashion importers, conference organisers, television presenters, I've had some really good ones, journalists, tons, a couple of really good novelists, one very famous in Spain, intelligence analyst, Everybody I trained in Monterey, I think, they're going out working for the, not everybody, but a high percentage uh, would be working for the American uh, intelligence services and some of the others would be working for the Chinese intelligence services. That doesn't bother me. I just tell them to, I get this fantasy that a few years out, these people are going to be spying on each other. And that's all right. I just tell them, spy well. Generate knowledge on each other. Generate good knowledge. Do your job well with skills. Intelligence analysts, okay. Some of them are called translators there. Diplomats, yes, doing the same thing. Public relations, lots. Marketing creators, some very good ones as well. Bilingual secretaries, why not? They have a lot of power. People in tourism, world's major, one of the world's major industries. Lots of teachers and professors a few technical writers, some terminologists, project managers, post editors, and yes, a few translators and interpreters. Why am I telling you this? All those people are communicating across cultures and I'm, I'm happy to be giving skills that can be used in all those occupations. My second point though with this list is that all the ones you read there, all those people are communicating mainly with spoken language. They're using their communication skills orally, Writ sometimes written, but mainly orally. And that's something we have to really take on board. And this is my closing suggestion for you. What do we do in translation studies? What do we do when we train people? We separate the written from the spoken. Written translation over here, interpreting over here. Wrong. If we look at where our graduates go, if we appreciate the diversity of things, uh, we should realize increasingly that everybody needs those spoken translation skills that have been unfortunately separated off as interpreting. From that basis, I think we have to go back to the beginning, start working on where we train people for, look at the diverse uh, range of occupations and introduce the spoken very strongly right at the beginning. I will almost finish. I've got, I've got just a couple of minutes left, okay? And this is, this is a political comment. Uh, I don't know, I, I'm listed on a website somewhere as a strategic consultant for WITA. And a few months ago, well, I don't know, in November last year, a journalist from the Australian Broadcasting Commission at, contacted, not me, he contacted the university, and he says, look, this Professor Pym here, how much money is he getting as a consultant for WITA? And uh, the phone call came through, and I was very proud to say, nothing, I don't get paid at all. They said, well, why are you doing it? I say, I actually care about training translators and interpreters. I think it's a good thing to do. My comment didn't get in the official report. You can see here's a screen grab from the report on Australian television, how the Chinese Communist Party infiltrated Australia's universities. And we've got a picture of a plenary speech given at the uh, Federa International Federation of Translators Congress in Brisbane. I know it well because I spoke just after that, man. 
yes, there is all kinds of of propaganda and rumor and conspiracy theories surrounding this. Uh, so just in case any of Australian spies or otherwise are listening to this talk, let me state this very clearly. I'm very happy to work with WETA, with Chinese, with Americans, with, with, with Swiss, as I've cited them there, uh, and European projects. I'm happy to work with anybody who can develop communication skills across cultures because good communication is good for everybody, for one side and the other. Uh, so with that proviso, let me say, why do most of our graduates not become translators and interpreters? I think at the end of the day, because there are more important things to do.